lecture, 16th lecture of the uh, Malay Maritime Civilization Project, which we began in August of 2021. Uh, this series uh, is uh, uh, to establish uh, a discourse on the Malay maritime society and Malay maritime tradition. As uh, many of us may be aware, uh, recently there was uh, the issue of uh, uh, some misrepresentation in an academic paper on Malay maritime history. And I think this is uh, uh, an important or significant uh, uh, lecture. Uh, may not be directly related to this lecture, but certainly it is part of our uh, initiative to project uh, and to promote uh, and to uh, uh, create a conversation on the history of uh, Malay maritime civilization. Uh, in Indonesia, the uh, uh, discourse, uh, the community is very active. Uh, they have uh, uh, professors and scholars uh, to study the maritime world of the archipelago. Uh, they have pronounced also Indonesia as a maritime nation. I think uh, Dr. Sabri don't know uh, very much. Uh, he will tell about Malaysia and, and, and the region. I, I don't want to take away from him, but nevertheless, uh, uh, there are a number of reasons why we are having this uh, this uh, project. Uh, one is to an attempt to redefine civilization. Uh, you know, in Malaysia, uh, there is a, this moon and this this sentiment of deconstructing the Malay and saying that the Malays have no history, no society, no civilization. Uh, and uh, much of this has been done with malice. Uh, I think on our part, it's important for us to respond accordingly in terms of looking at civilization not from a continental land-based perspective, but from a maritime perspective. If we define civilization from a land-based perspective, Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you. If we define uh, civilization from a land based continental perspective, uh, we'll never understand who the Malays are. Uh, because we'll be looking at civilization uh, uh, with, with a visual of the uh, Great Wall of China, the pyramids, uh, uh, and other uh, monuments. Uh, maritime civilizations do not have such monuments. And maritime civilizations are uh, empirically different uh, from uh, continental civilizations. Uh, and uh, one of the major uh, areas uh, that uh, we see in history that uh, looks into the interaction within land and water is the Malay Archipelago. And uh, the Malay Archipelago is part of the arc of the Indian Ocean. So again, the Indian Ocean is a huge uh, area of civilization that has been uh, destroyed or subdued uh, with the coming of the Portuguese in the 1498. Uh, Panica called it the Vasco da Gama era, whereby when Vasco da Gama came through the back door, uh, it was good hope. Uh, he destroyed the order of civilization uh, across the arc of the Indian Ocean. And it, the, the Indian Ocean is also called the, uh, the Islamic Lake. So here we're looking at uh, uh, the eastern part of the Indian Ocean, the, the Tanah and Ayer. And uh, one of the things that has happened is the problem of the separation of Tanah and Ayer when the West came 
And I think this is one of the things that perhaps uh, Dato will address today. Uh, so uh, that is a major reason, the major reason why we are having this uh, discourse and we're extending this discourse uh, in various ways, uh, one of which is through book. But the idea also of this uh, of this uh, uh, initiative is to get people to think and to manifest uh, artifacts uh, relating to uh, Malay civilization. One of which is, you know, we're talking about uh, Malay ships, Malay boats, Malay jong, Mendam Marahi and so on. But where are they? Hmm? They're talking about huge Malay ships, uh, uh, the Kunlun Po, uh, going to China and sailing to to uh, to to Africa uh, over the last 1,000, 1,500 years. Uh, again, I think we need to work harder uh, to uh, empirically, not to say that those do not exist, but to empirically and 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 to discuss it, to write about it, to 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 develop uh, these things into into prose. Benam uh, Rahi was mentioned in the Sejarah uh, Melayu. There are many who dismiss the existence of Benam Rahi. Also, there is this uh, problem of uh, uh, flaw dilemma in Melaka. Again, I've raised this uh, about a decade back. Uh, why, uh, why you have this Portuguese ship and not the Malay ship? Um, also, when you talk about uh, uh, maritime civilization, uh, there is inherently a, a different culture. Well, you see, when you talk about Islam, uh, the discourse on Islam ends as I have told my student, ends uh, at the river Ganges. Uh, in other words, Islam is Arab, Persian, and Indian, and Turkish, not Malay. I uh, do think that the, uh, 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 the Malay, Malay society is marginal, and Islam in Malay society is marginal. So again, we are, we are, we are looking to this. Another, another thing is that, uh, taking the, the, the EQ from Ibn Khaldun, if Ibn Khaldun says that the Desert is uh, the civilization of the Arab, the Arab, not Islam, huh? the Arab. Then the Tanah Air is the reservoir of Malay civilization. So here we're talking about Tanah Air in, uh, uh, as a metaphor, as, as a concept, not literally Tanah and Air. And here uh, we are also trying to address uh, the problem of when Tanah and air is separated. So today we have uh, uh, a distinguished speaker. Uh, I know that to, uh, over social media uh, and, and we met a few times, uh, but I know uh, uh, his reputation, so that's why I've listed. In fact, uh, uh, in, in 2021, uh, in, in the larger poster, I listed about 17, basically 17, one pull out, but 17 uh, speakers, including uh, Dato, uh, Dr. Sabirin. So the title of uh, today's lecture is uh, 200 Years of Anglo-Dutch Treaty, 1824-2024, and the Straits of Malacca, Poor Vadis. Uh, speaker is Dato Dr. Sabarin Jaffa, adjunct professor, Institute of Malaysian and International Studies, UKM. We also have a co-speaker, uh, Cik uh, Huda Binti Mahmud, PhD candidate at St. Catherine's College, University of Cambridge. So she will speak uh, 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 to compliment uh, Dr. Dr. Sabarin. Uh, uh, this is a long, long, long uh, resume, eh? long CV. I'll, I'll, I'll go through a bit. Uh, uh, our speaker is uh, from the Judicial Legal Service. Uh, I have become a magistrate uh, and such and Scott judge. Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, served under the Attorney General Chambers as Deputy Public Prosecutor in Kuala Lumpur and Senior Federal Counsel International Advisory Division. Uh, he was also the legal advisor of the Ministry of Defense and director of legal and investigations of the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency. Uh, later, uh, he was seconded to the Malaysian Thai Joint Authority, MTJA, as its legal and administration manager before opting for early retirement in 2011 uh, to take up an appointment at a university. Uh, and... Uh, 
Dr. Sabrin took the time to join uh, as Professor of Business Law and Ethics at the International Business School, UC Technology Malaysia, uh, teaching master students uh, alongside supervising PhD students. Um, the British Foreign and Government Office awarded him a full chevening scholarship to pursue a PhD in maritime studies at Greenwich Maritime Institute. That's across the river, isn't it? <laughs> While pursuing his PhD, he interned at the International Maritime Organization, uh, London. Uh, and today, uh, Dr. Savarin is uh, often sought for advice concerning maritime and is actively involved in the London-based Seafarers Rights International Association. Um, <clears throat> he was appointed as Judicial Commissioner at the High Court in Johor Bahru uh, in 2014 and uh, Pro-Chancellor of University Technology Malaysia, Melaka, in 2019. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have to mention this also, that uh, Dr. Dr. Saverin has been the Director General of the Maritime Institute of Malaysia. That's when I knew, that's when I, I, I came across your name, right? when you were DG of uh, MIMA. Uh, an agency at the Ministry of, Malaysian Ministry of Transport from 2020 to 2023. At MIMA, uh, uh, among others, he led the research on ports and shipping and traveled to study major ports in Malaysia, Indonesia, Canada, and the United States. Um, our co-speaker, uh, Cik Huda Mahmud, uh, uh, she's online. I hope she can she can hear us. Huh? Oh. Um, oh, yes, okay. I'm... Can, can you hear? Yes. Okay, okay, right. Thank you. Uh, Jehuda is a researcher with nine years of experience in the social sciences, uh, writing and editing. Uh, she focused on the maritime research with the Maritime Institute of Malaysia since 2019 and led research projects in areas such as national legislation based on the IMO international conventions niche marine industries and activities, as well as port developments. Uh, Huda is currently the Assistant Director of Research at the Director of Research Office uh, and has headed two centers in ocean law and policy and maritime economics and industries. She was also the editor of several Myanmar publications and currently she is a PhD candidate uh, on the subject of ports in, at Cambridge University. Uh, with that, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I hand over to Dr. Dr. Sabrin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Murad, for inviting me to this uh, glorious <laughs> uh, institution. Um, uh, and also giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts uh, on this topic. Uh, but I would like to start uh, this uh, uh, talk uh, with, uh, uh, with a caveat yeah? um, and disclaimer uh, that I'm not uh, a historian because uh, of late, you see in Malaysia, a lot of people claiming to be historian, expert on this, you know, some are quite laughable, I tell you. Yeah? things about involving religion, whatever. So I don't want to fall into that. You know, I don't want to be another one who talking, talking about we are descendant of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, whatever, you know. So uh, uh, I, I was uh, uh, still, I'm uh, a lawyer by profession. So I see history differently. Yeah. Uh, uh, in my involvement, a little bit of involvement in uh, helping uh, the country prepare the case uh, in uh, ICJ, for example, Pulau uh, Batu Putih and uh, Sipadan and Nikitan. We know that uh, all this, uh, it's nice to hear the, the history, but everything you must prove. Empirical evidence, we call it now. So uh, it's not like Chita uh, Chita, Hikayat, whatever. Uh, the, the tragedy is that, like in Pulau Batu Kuti case, that we won the argument on history, but we lost the case because of that document. Okay, so uh, I always see that when we when I was in Mima before I, was, I started a project, but it didn't get through. 
uh, about you know uh, compiling and uh, writing maritime history in Malaysia, but based on documents, which would help. Uh, I remember uh, Professor Shahri before from UKM helping the team of Pulau Sipan and Nikitan and Bapak Tukuti as well. You know? So, Shahri Lembang. Shahri Lembang. So, so that's what I, I look differently. Uh, so, I, I don't claim that I'm a, a historian here. I love history very much. Uh, uh, I read a lot of history, but uh, I didn't I don't know about the methodology or whatever, I just say. So try to find the best books, uh, you know, or manuscript available just to to get to know things. Um uh, secondly, uh, uh uh this is not lecture about history. Yeah, this is uh although it, it, from the topic you see that we're we're tackling. 1824 Anglo Dutch Treaty, which we will should we say celebrate or oh, oh, no, we don't celebrate it on the 17th of March next month. Yeah, the 200th uh, anniversary. <laughs> so, but I don't think we should celebrate that. You know? no. So, uh, commemoration, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> when I was in the sixth form, I remember I have a very good how I got interested into his history is because my teacher, a uh, very good uh, history teacher, he explained. That during my time we have this uh, textbook from uh, Malaysia, Indonesia. We studied quite deep into history of Indonesia and East uh, Asian uh, uh, countries, and we read novel as well. Uh, and then he mentioned about the history of uh, this uh, struggle for independence from both sides, Indonesia and Malaysia. They all wanted to amalgamate the archipelago again, mm -hmm. and all started when they have this uh, London Treaty. The name of the English of 1824. So the both sides try to to merge and try to discard this, you know. But I will try to explain it further. They the... uh, they, during their struggle for independence, oh, is... by Sukarno in the forties, fifties, here to Burhanuddin, whatever. That's why they wanted uh there's a plan to to declare independence at the same time. Remember. Uh, when they declared it, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's so all. You have declared the same day that the Bondian was supposed to declare in Taiping. Yes, unfortunately, it didn't happen in Malaysia because the Bitang Tinker came in and then the British came in. So, that's it. Otherwise, the history will be different from now, you know. We may like it, may not like it, you know. So, so, so that's why this 1824 agreement to me is very important since uh, I learned about this. And I have spent interest on this. So when um, uh, second thing, I, uh, why that the topic is important for me that uh, uh, I I came from Malacca. I was born in Malacca, raised and school there until SPM level, uh, and uh, still quite active in in Malacca. And uh, to know Malaysia, to know to know Malacca is to know Malaysia. <laughs> that mean the history of the Malays and the kingdom, whatever you must you can't rather forget uh, the the Malacca things. You know? So uh, then, because the Malacca is a small, small territory now, but the Straits of Malacca is well known all over the world until now. You know why they call it Straits of Malacca? It's because they have the kingdom is so uh, influential in terms of a uh, trade uh, in the fifteenth uh, century. Yeah, yeah, of course, Malacca. So uh, I've discussed with Huda about this. You know that. Um, what happened now? From 1824, we should examine why that the two two major powers then, the uh, uh, the UK, uh, the British, and the uh, the Dutch then uh, wanted to have this agreement. What's the other? You know, they had this earlier agreement, the same agreement in 1814, but it didn't uh, work well. So they have this, which is more conclusive. If you see the document. Uh, you see there's PDF in, in the internet. Uh, you see the document is it's very detailed one. It's not like a normal agreement, yeah. It's with explanation what to do, what not to do, whatever. So this is quite quite important. Uh, and what happened after that? You know, until now it's two hundred years already. Two hundred years is still not that long, probably. It's only five generations, right? five or six generations. So uh, it's it's very very new. And remember that uh, eighteen twenty four. Uh, 
was about uh, slightly over 300 years of 1511. There's another, everybody who's uh, read history knows what 1511 means. 24 August. <laughs> because I came from Malaysia, no, they, 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 15, uh, yeah, 24th August, 1511, where Malaysia was defeated by Portuguese. Yeah, okay. And they see a lot of things, you know. And I will also uh, explain uh, the concept of freedom, freedom uh, of the seas. Uh, what you call it, uh, uh, Mary Libram, and uh, as opposed to Mary Closum, Mary Closum, maybe the close sea, and how it impacted this one, and how they come up with that. Okay, it's very interesting. So, uh, because of this, I got interested. So, I did my uh, studies for my uh, uh, study degrees in maritime. I did my master's in uh, in uh, Wales. Uh, my dissertation was on the um, safety of the navigation in Sri Lanka. But four years later, I did my another one, my PhD. The thesis is on the security ex aspect of the Sri Lanka as well. So I have, you know, uh, always want to attach myself to Malacca. <laughs> so um, I was assisted uh, uh, while preparing this uh, uh, topic. Uh, with uh, my colleagues at MIMA, first Cik Hara Anwar uh, Manso, who is here, was helping me, uh, and Huda as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that, that is the the, the caveat. Um, uh, today is a very auspicious day. Uh, um, Prof. I must mention this. Uh, that thank you for choosing this day. I remember you asked to have a date in late, uh, late December by until Huda to come in. Huda was busy uh, for her preparation to go to Cambridge. Then uh, then uh, she has settled in. So I think this date is nice. And it is uh, bersamaan yes, dengan, dengan uh, permulaan <laughs> uh, uh, Agung yang baru. Yang baru today, you know. Uh, I'm the 16 lecture, uh, Agung is the 17 Agung. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was 16 and it's more. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, some part of the presentation will be dealt with by uh, Chi Huda from Cambridge. Uh, this is uh, just to give a background, and also in Mima, I headed a team. The previous uh, Minister of uh, Transport uh, asked us to do a uh, study on ports. Uh, how, to, uh, how, to, how to say it, you know, uh, post COVID things, you know. Uh, people then realize how 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 port was so important during COVID, you know, giving us, you know, what we have on our table, food and whatever during the COVID time and so important. So how to revive the activities. So we were asked to do this. Uh, we, give, we were given uh, some budget and I and my team travel uh, extensively on this. And and some of the port that we visited and made case study uh, were ports along the streets of Malacca. So, and that ports were not there when this agreement was signed. The treaty was signed in 1824. It's not there yet. Okay. Uh, in fact, if we read, you know, this uh, since our uh, the king of Malaysia now is new term. The king of Malaysia now came from Johor. Uh, last year they commemorate the 200 years of that formation of this, uh, the 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 new state of Johor, modern Johor. Yeah, because of the friendly treaties between the British and the Temenggong of the Raman and then whatever, it's last year. I mean, 200 years, eh? in 1823. So all this come into one. Eh? Another thing that when I mentioned the Straits of Malacca, Strait with S, is not Slat Malacca in Malay. Mm -hmm. The Straits of Malacca means Straits of Malacca plus Straits of Johor and Strait of Singapore. So, yeah. But but uh, when you go to the land and the importance is very important, yeah. I will mention the story about uh, uh, Santa Catarina ship, uh, which became a case uh, in uh, in uh, in 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 Europe, and it becomes you know uh, how the modern institutional law was founded is based from that case, and also related with Central America. So that's why I think I find it very interesting. I don't know how to actually uh, present this in the store. You know, it's like a little bit of a Yeah. 
So probably I can start with that, you know, uh, in uh, 15 zero, I think 16 zero three, there was a, uh, a galleon, uh, a three master or four master seagoing ship from Portuguese called Santa Catarina, which was actually uh, subdued by uh, the opposing side, which is the Dutch in the eastern side of Singapore. It, it has a big price, you know, uh, very expensive item in it. So it was sold as a, a barang rampasan in Europe, you know, porcelain, uh, I call it uh, sutra, you know, and all this uh, in Europe. And, and the Portuguese, you know, they objected to this and it became a matter of court in Europe. They have a loose uh, institution then. And the Dutch uh, sent their uh, foremost uh, juries called Hugo Grotius, what we we know him now as the father of international law, which I doubt very much, you know. I argued in my thesis, you know, that, yeah, international law, but so called. So, so called, people say, you know. But the jury they argued that, you know, uh, that whatever they done is, 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 is legal. Why? They, he came with the idea of open seas, the dominion of the sea. Remember the Papal Bull? Yeah. Uh, 18, uh, sorry, uh, 1494, I think. Uh, Papal Bull, it's not a bull that we know now. It's, it's a document from the Pope, which uh, which uh, carved the world the two spheres. Yeah. Right? It's for Portuguese and one is Spanish. Yes. Spanish. Uh, so that means all that, you know, the whole dominion to them in the world is this. Okay, so the British argued. And then, sorry, the, uh, that is like, very close to them, yeah. close to this. They mean all belong to this, uh, uh, which the Portuguese says, yes. So, uh, so Grotius argued, you know, and over decades it become accepted, you know, that you must limit this dominion at sea, sea dominion. And it was the, the it was accepted later on when other juries by the, uh, uh, of the Dutch, uh, I think Cornelius uh, Van when they shook, I think in in six in seventeen zero three, hundred years later, they came with, with the idea of a canon short rule. Remember that? That means you must limit your dominant sea or sovereignty at sea by the distance from the coast, and how you measure that is by the nautical miles. And I mean, uh, the canon short then it will fall at the sea three nautical miles from where it's short lah. So they come think about the nautica. And three nautical miles is not miles, it's more than miles. Okay. And uh, they the basic, you know. And this evolved now in, in UN Commission Law of the Sea and Clause now. They took it, you know, for that for the sovereignty at sea, the, the literal state has three nautical miles. Yeah, but now it's expanded, you know, you can claim up to 12 now. But the basic is three is yours. Like Singapore never claimed 12, they claim only three. The basic one, so they all come from that. Twenty years, uh, uh, history of this uh, canon short rule, you know, dominate sea. So it's very interesting. So w w this this the pendulum, you know, about the uh, Mary Clausum and Mary Liberum. I I, I listen I know very interestingly uh, the, the the lecture by Professor Farish, you know, no, no, no. which is we touched a bit about on this, yeah. So um. Uh, probably I can add something about the, the legal part of it. I, I'm not a municipal lawyer, you know, we talk about acts, regulation, but in session law, we talk about convention, about conferences, yeah. So we have, now, uh, after the Second World War, yeah, we have this, uh, em the emergence of new negara bangsa, what call it in English? Uh, nation state. New nation state now, yeah. And they want to claim more about this. So they have three UNCLOS. You know, UN Conference on Law of the Sea, not Convention. Yeah? These people are always confused, it, you know. Uh, UNCLOS means UN Conference on the Law of the Sea. There are three conferences. The first one is UN Convention, uh, sorry, UNCLOS 1, uh, 2058, uh, which uh, uh, known, later on known and meant into Geneva Convention. Okay. And then they have unclosed conference number two. They didn't come up with anything. And then now the, we had the unclosed three from 19, 
1968 until 1982, which now culminated into what we have now, UN Convention Law, which has become a convention. Yeah, a convention. We may accept it. That is, they call it the Constitution of the Sea. The single largest document which bind all the states in the world now is this. So, to, I don't want to confuse UNCLOS, conference with UNCLOS Convention. So, many scholars name it like LOC Convention, LOC Convention, or just UN Convention 1982, because in that year, only one convention was passed by UN. Okay? 1982. So, yeah, so I will use that UN Convention 1982. Not yeah. by US? Uh, not your US. By US, they have this, they have smarter lawyers. Okay, so they, they did. They are not verified. Yeah, the, the six major major uh, shipping uh, or maritime powers in the world they didn't sign it because some part, you know, it is a, what do you call it, the the uh, package deal concept. I don't know, they take, take it or leave it. So, these big states, I think. The major one, Germany, like uh, UK, US, there. But they they smarter. They use one concept in uh, international law, which call is that uh, they call it that the international customary law thing, which is accepted by the majority. You also can imply that. <laughs> so so <laughs> they they using it because of big big states, American power. They don't want it Singapore. They want it. They want to have less the three, but, but so more ship will come. Okay, like US, you see, for them it's good for them. They have other ways of controlling other other countries, Look, but uh, poorer states like you know African countries they like to have more territory, but but they, they cannot they can control it. I think uh, Dr. Hashim Jalal, a famous uh, maritime lawyer in Indonesia, uh, he was the ambassador at large, you know, uh, Indonesia before he was practically uh, asked to leave after the loss of Rossi Biden. But he is very, uh, very uh, Pati Jalal is his uh, uh, doctor, very famous. Uh, and this uh, Hashim Jalal mentioned that, you know, one is regret that we fought so much on this territory at sea. Unfortunately, we don't know how to control and get results from that. Yeah. I mean, you have then the concept in uh, UN Convention, they call it uh, archipelagic state. They mean how this is an air, they call it the air evolve. So Sukarno was a smart guy. Yeah. He sent two brilliant scholars to the US. And they made a thesis, a PC thesis at Virginia, uh, uh, which is Bahim Jalal and Mohtar Swapmaja, another the former oh, okay. minister. They're two brilliant uh, maritime <laughs> lawyers. Prima Indonesia, they came up with the the the, the idea oh. of archipelagic nation, state, and archipelagic sea lanes, whatever, and it was adopted by, by by uh, the conference and clause. I, I remember a couple of years back there was a a small forum attended by our during this is before Pulau Batu Putih things, you know, our program negara dan, you know, and we have been invited one KSU, I think that's is a kahitam. Why was that? Say we didn't, uh, you know, uh, 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 fight for Natuna and Anambas. You know, this this is a severe influence from this uh, Anglo Dutch Treaty, eighteen twenty four. Indonesia take everything, which was uh, primarily owned by the Dutch, and uh, Malaya, uh, Malaysia take it, took it. Uh, what is left by the British, but but. Natuna and Anambas, and if you fly to Kota Kinabalu or to Kuching, you'll see the island very nice. Eh? That island is not that, but Indonesia claim it. And we didn't put a, con a contest to that. So until now, it becomes them. In Indonesia, now, with the problem with China, they changed the name now from uh, Laut Jisatan to uh, Laut Natuna Utara. Yeah, yeah. So it become a, 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 funny, a flashing point now in uh, South China Sea of the new things. Eh? Um, uh, leaving that aside, so uh, these two these two uh, scholars came with a thesis, and we come and and, and we have this. So Tansi uh, so you know why that we didn't uh, claim that uh, then we are so concerned about Sri Song Laka. because then you know in fifty seven Sarawak are not and Sarawak not yet joining us. They were actually not Malaysia yet. They joined us in fifty three. They are small. <laughs> the fifty three. So uh, that's why I didn't care much, you know. But now, uh, so we have this quick pro quo that 
and you just say you support our claim for for the for this uh Straits of Malacca. You remember that I, that I informed my prof about this uh, the the sovereignty at sea, three nautical miles, yeah. you know, and then they go to two nautical miles if you can claim it, you know. But if you like our map, the the map that we we claim or uh, we insist in ours. We call it Peta Baru, 1979, you know, which we deposit in UN. Some, 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 you know, go to the north of, north of uh, peninsula, you see Pulau Perak and Pulau Jara. It's way beyond that 12 nautical miles. So, so Tengku wanted to have, to have that control for Straits of Malacca. Yeah, the, Malacca, the thought of Malaysia then, it's about important for us, the Malacca, and for Singapore as well. So, we don't see much important in that uh, Sabah and Sarawak or Borneo or Natuna or Anambat whatever you know uh, so that's why quit pro quo you support us we support your claim for archipelagic nation <laughs> that's how they play this music that time you know they play smart but now when we are all then we start you know then we see that uh, it's not that really good for us you know so this is quite interesting how things actually involve. So I quite interesting when we talk about maritime things, big thing, you know, that people don't say it very much, you know. So when uh, we they signed this, am I taking Uda's time? Not yet, yeah? No, we still have time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about history, tak ta habis, habis. Uh, uh, You know, remember when they signed this, uh, Treaty 1824, there were no Johor yet. Yeah? No, Singapore was just founded in 1819, right? Uh, Penang was there, you know? Penang was uh, 1786, remember it? So uh, we have uh, the streets of, the street settlement on, you know? Penang, Singapore, my place Melaka, uh, and uh, Dinding and Panko, okay? Uh, but Dinding was surrendered to, to Perak in, uh, not, not, not very long ago. Yes, uh, 1938. <laughs> Before that, it is street settlement. Okay, the Setiawan, Manjung, semua, they are all actually settlement, you know. I remember my father in the 50s said, no, we don't have king. Our king is queen. I remember that. <laughs> so Queen Elizabeth. So, so when the queen came to my to Malacca to visit the late queen, eh, in 1971, I think my father cycled to the Malacca to see the queen. Because dulu ni raja kita. I don't understand what to do. But Malacca has no sultan. Sultan gone 1511 already. <laughs> So that is the history, you know. Uh, so and and uh, uh, you'd be surprised that some people they call uh, Lord Fakar, you know, who was a governor of Malacca, as 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 Raja. Yes. He got he got a Malay wife, right? The Fakar. Uh, Fakar got a Malay wife. So he's Malacca wife. Malacca. Malacca wife. The Malay. My, I don't know whether the whether they in Malay. I see. I don't know the Muslim. No, I don't know. So uh, Lord Fakar, which is actually doesn't come eye to eye with Raffle, the agent, you know. Because Raffa is a company, you know, this uh, Fakar was a government. Yes. So, um, very interesting, you read Hikayat uh, uh, yeah, Abdullah yeah, yeah. about this, this story about this, you know, uh, uh, Lord Fakar and, uh, and uh, Lord Fakar is a, it's a, what? a very deep into Malay custom. Yes. So, uh, people cried, they say, when Fakar left Singapore to retire. Yes. So people in Singapore and then they set up at Malacca. So thousand people came to the shore saying Salamat, Salamat. You know? Pakai will say Salamat, Salamat. You know? So it's all recorded in uh, Munshi. You know? He brought his wife along, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's quite interesting. So I didn't manage to go and see his... I didn't go and manage to see his, his uh, grave in Scotland. <laughs> Scotland. But they were competing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's true. So... so uh, uh, Raffles should, you know, yeah. but he's from company. Yeah, but but it's a uh, Fakar is government, yeah. He's what they got, Pilinan Petri, what they call it, eh? Uh, uh, they term that, you know, this the agent. Plenty potentiary. Yeah. I mean, the, the right agent for that. So, uh, coming back to this, this. So, we when we see this uh, 1824 uh, treaty, that was the, the scenario then, okay? Now, I'm try to look, you know, over this, you know, uh, what next? Did you see this development from 1826? How actually we try to understand this colonist power? What have in the mind, you know, to make this relevant until now? It, there's no, there's no like, there's no, there's no like time, time, time limit, like 
uh, we have like Singapore selagi dia bulan Mintang eh that mean you surrender in perpetuity that mean you pajak semua hidup lah sam- sampai hari kiamat kan eh in term in the Malay is selagi ada bulan Mintang that mean semua kiamat lah so in perpetuity they call it like Sab- Sabah case from Sulu Penang case as well you know ada ada pay they still paying until now because of that but this agreement tak sebut apa pun so but it's overtaken by event now because we have the new convention we have the UN commercial law the C now whatever can you see that but i think the two opposing side now the british and the dutch they want uh, foremost is actually uh, relating back to uh, prof uh, farish nose uh, lecture the 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 conflict here actually origin from from their mainland in europe right they are fighting like malacca was surrendered you know to for the british to take care during the napoleonic war yeah 1803 1812 yeah and munshi abdul munshi to mention in the hikayat you know how during the parade to change power how muka mereka marah merah padam i mean the blunder you know, want to give them like to, to the british untuk safe keeping only for safe, only for safe keeping yeah Safe keeping, eh? muka dia muka murah padam nak, nak serahkan pedang apa semua tu kan. Uh, but they were smart, you know. Uh, they didn't want to make Melaka bigger. So when they have this, uh, they take Melaka for good uh, in this treaty, they they uh, they want to suppress Melaka and raise Singapore. Singapore, just like uh, Penang as well. So they have this idea. So how is now, see? 200 years now, Singapore become, you know, for so many times, the number one port in the world before overtaken by Shanghai, uh, about 15 years ago, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, I, I was discussing Huda about, you know, uh, the trade in the, along the street, what will happen, you know. Uh, we have uh, new challenges, uh, like the, the always, they want to revive the, the Isthmus Kra Canal, yeah. And now they say they want to change it to a uh, land bridge. You know, will that affect our port? Whatever I think, Uda will will explain that. Um, but surprised uh, at the juncture to mention that you know at this, uh, the the two opposing power coming together on the table, signing a treaty, it really shaped you know. So, uh, I was uh, I did my PhD uh, on security on the piracy at sea. Uh, and then uh, they made, you know, this Lanun or come from the word Ilanun from from Borneo. Uh, it's actually not Lanun. They are all sea warriors yeah. from the Sultan. You know, they are guarding me. But people make it Lanun, and they have the law there, and they impose it Lanun, Lanun lah. You meant to fight it. And Lanun has one particular particular article in the convention. Yeah, convention on. I mean, what happened? The whole state must go and you know suppress them, like what happened in Somali things. You know, it's come from that. You know, it they come from Central Malacca, because uh, you know how it happened then. If you look this uh, uh the old vessels uh with mast, you know, uh like in Pirate Caribbean, you see they can only move forward. They cannot turn back. And uh, and the 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 Maria Magolit, the cannon are at the both sides. You know. So how actually the, the Lanun was suppressed? That was, I think, after this. Uh, is that the change in technology? They have the motor vehicle. Now they can turn back and chase the pirate. <laughs> Before that, how is that? And there are hundreds of the sampan with warriors. They go, you know, after the... They will follow the ship and they will attack the ship, you know, and plunder whatever they can get or burn the ship. So then with the technology now, they can actually pushing. That's why now you don't have ship. Meriam ke tepi lagi dah, itu depan, you know, because they can how they are overtaken by event lah, event. So, uh, so uh, <clears throat> when they have this a treaty, they have this in, in mind, because all their punya, apa ni, uh, sea, apa ni, the vessel semua, uh, all actually uh, uh, under prone to the uh, practical attacks, Mr. Malaka. So, they must have one power we control it. So, they decide lah, aku jaga Sat Malaka, aku jaga dengan sana. So the blunder, you know, the uh, uh, petah Melayu, macam blunder dapat tanah. Mm-hmm. The blunder, they lack tanah very much. <laughs> because they're so small. You know, when I went to blunder first by Melayu, so tempat ini lagi sangat. Huh? That's why we talk about uh, Indonesian nationalists. Mm-hmm. When they start sending some of the students studying in Leiden or in uh, apa ni, in blunder, they're so shocked, so small, not even one third of Jawa. And that they bring down and become like a nationalistic punya again again the thing. So, so Papa Tamlaju, 
uh, bagai belanda dapat tanah dia so greedy of to get land so they want bigger land in indonesia <laughs> but british was smarter they think about trade trade so they think they have the idea of controlling the trade and from you know the country said to melaka and the way up to china china you see how things change now then probably about uh, they they're faring you know like uh, silk Uh, like uh, porcelain from China, but now the same become important for oil and gas. <laughs> Over the years, they change, right? Since people uh, started, uh, you know, uh, inventing cars, whatever need petrol, whatever now, and for energy, things change now. So when you look this eighteen twenty six until now, it's a different uh, perspective now, yeah. But it's more important, you know, uh, the survey that uh, about eighty thousand ships flying the strait every year. So one our researcher in Mima say they make projection probably <clears throat> the maximum which they could afford, you know, probably hundred forty thousand, you know, forty thousand. So this idea coming like you know, how to this, you know. So I think um, where should I stop? You know? yeah, that's stop things, you know. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you can ask questions so easy before we go to uh Jehuda. Uh, uh, I, I like to uh, raise uh, this issue of uh, one. Uh, is there an expiry date for the treaty? Is there a legal or whatever customary expiry date as in the Bangkok Treaty, for example? Mm -hmm. So, eighteen twenty four, and then eighteen twenty six, they exchanged Malacca and Bangkulan. Mm -hmm. That's one. Uh, second is that based on what you just said. I can see the dynamics of uh, how the archipelago, how the Tanah Air, uh, is a major contributor to uh, international civilization in terms of law, in terms of international law. Uh, uh, one with regard to the Straits of Malacca, with regard to the incident between the capture of the uh, Portuguese ship, also with regard to the Ilanum. Uh, which uh, has uh, uh, you know uh, uh, plays a major role in also the history of Kedah mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. and that's why you know, even uh, they was the British were so fascinated with the Ilanun yeah. that uh, Francis Light named his son Francis Lanun Light uh, <laughs> from from the Ilanun. I didn't Ilanun. Today. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and and uh, we thought that Lanun ni because see the Lanun uh, you know because of the behavior and so on they, so the word pirates you know the ikhtibar ada berasa tu and uh, there is a settlement of Lanun in Kuala Prai kat Penang in uh, 1780 1790s you know? uh, throughout so again anyway but anyway <laughs> coming back to the two things <laughs> yeah. okay um, I I I I uh, I need to study more. I've checked uh, last night the the PDF on the agreement. Uh, I, I I forgot to check about the date, you know. But I think my first because reading there's no date mentioned, yeah. Uh, but I was fascinated by the language, <laughs> how they, the the you know the 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 coin in that time the English is so beautiful, yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, even if the it is expiry date, you know, it's already about to come back event now. Yeah, okay. Because of the emergence of the of the new. Well, that was a naughty question on my part. Didn't yeah, I? yeah. Because now you know, Singapore was not there yet, or, or just you know a, a small village. By then, eighteen twenty four, Singapore flourished because of this Anglo city, because they allow it. You know, okay. And then we have the advent of this, uh, the founding of the Johor modern state. Yeah, you know, and then, uh, you know the, the another interesting story about why that. The Temenggong was given the land, but it's big land, you know. But then it's all it's hutan belantara of Johor. Yeah, Temu Temu Raman was the one who's, who had made the tree with uh, you know Crawford and you know and uh, and, and Raffles then you know. So because this uh, Temenggong Raman, they need they, they control the, the sea the sea people, you know. The one with the blonde, oh, 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 right? So do, they said they have a very special relationship between the palace and until now with Selatara people, and because because of the help of this, okay. Then you know that the real Sultan from Melaka, you know all this uh, Malay psyche. You must have a Sultan with darah from Siguntang Mahameru, whatever you know. You must have in. Uh, you cannot have a uh, you know uh, become a Sultan. You got the 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 Dowland sovereignty, you know. 
a king can appoint can give sovereign to the wife you know take commoner you become tuanku you know it's happened you know but for the nasab you must be from that you know that's why from Malacca one first they go to Johor died with the marhum makati julang in the 99 and then Perak now is the one you know still you know but along the way the the warriors no say pirate like the warriors from 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 uh, Bugis who were, they created a position tongku tongku tua tuan tu pun muda tongku muda dah dia ada jadi faktor sultan okey for 200 years dia ada jadi faktor sultan yeah yeah and then uh, raja haji and uh, adik dia raja lumu become sultan here even johor all this uh, even our former prime minister tun razak semua all from this so they warrior kan so, uh, so to, the story about this thing uh, the malacca sultan from uh, riau linga they, they don't care much about because they want to go to malacca So I think the British promised them you can come, go to Moa, Moa and Pago, then you can take Melaka after this. Because uh, if you go to 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 Umbai in Melaka, the most there, there is a the mausoleum of the last Sultan Raju Raju yang mati tu. Okay, you know uh, because of that problem, there's a lot of problem, and then uh, uh, the the I saw the the picture of this uh, TMM, not TMJ. Tengku Mako Temoa, very handsome guy in the western suit, you know. So, uh, because it was annexed, eh? annexed by Maharaja Ubaka, so Johor, and it become uh, so Moa and uh, Pago now is uh, Kesang, eh? yeah, is yeah. under Johor now. Eh? It was a uh, German Tah war, and I think in in nineteen eighteen fifty five, that you know. So, so this story because they believe they want to go there, you know. Uh, they want to go and they promise to become Raja Melaka, but they lost already for years. Yes. They only want to back and get back uh, Melaka, you know, because of this darah, darah Melaka lah, kan? Eh? Uh, and 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 the Johor, uh, the darah, the sovereignty is not from this, because the Menggong. Sovereignty is given by another king, which is Queen Victoria. This this why this why you see that the adat Johor is different now now it's agung it's yes, Johor yes, yes, yes. it's different they don't kiss eh? they they don't uh, sembah yeah, yeah, yeah. they bow yes, they yes. kusi whatever and the the name yeah. more it's because the 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 daulat sovereignty come from Victoria it's not it's not Malay yeah. Sultan yeah. but under constitution now the Malay Sultan yeah. but the daulat comes yeah, yeah. like Kedah Perlis dengan wajah the daulat from from Siam eh? oh, Raja Siam yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, it's, it's different. I got this from Prof. Kogi Kim himself. No, I'm not talking about it. Oh, he's yeah. yeah, because before, before Bangkok Treaty 1909, they were from under Thailand. So they got, they got their punya tu, uh, daripada Ajay Siam. What, yeah. what, what, before 1909? 1909? When they get the, the uh, sovereignty? They are, they are, they are already there. So they got from Siam lah. After that, you know, because they're already there already, kan? they continue. After after they they come in part of Malaya, okay. So much like much like Kedah, they got it from from Thailand. Ah, uh, yeah, they they the oldest lah, the two century. But to to detail on this lah, ah, uh, so so yeah, so so like 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 uh like uh like like Slango, because they they tua muda kan, ah, pada pada Bugis, they got it uh, from Pera. So the first Sultan of Perak gave sovereignty to Selangor. Yeah. So you see, you see among our ni the pairing of the Sultan yes, because yes. of the history. Let's say Johor always uh, apa ni close dengan dengan Pahang, Selangor dengan Perak. Uh, they have this pairing because of the history. Uh, like uh, the Perlis and Kelantan, Kelantan, yeah. Kelantan kan? Bill got married, kan? Yeah. Uh, through that, you know. Uh, Datuk, the, 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 the thing uh, probably Uda I'll always Uda be waiting. The sorry to to uh, drag you from your bed uh, in this winter ah, morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one more question. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hope you can have a program for the you know thirteen upon it. Uh, 17 March. Fantastic. We have that where we can appear on Minerva's side mentioned about this, yeah? yeah we can uh, the idea that probably I can put later about what happened, how do we take lesson from this for our modern Malaysia now, from this. You know, uh, how how we can shape our mind for the future. You know, how the agreement can shape, you know, a new uh, nation state. We have ASEAN now, you know. We have new ports coming out now, new whatever. So, so a lot of things. So, 
can I invite you know yeah. uh, Cik Huda from uh, Saint Catherine yes. uh, Cambridge to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to present your your research? Yeah, Cik Huda, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dato Sabirin, and thank you so much for this very honorable invitation, uh, Professor Mahmurat Mahmoudnor, American. And I'm so sorry I didn't hear who else was in the room, but I would like to greet all esteemed academics and participants in uh, this room. And Assalamualaikum and Salam Sejahtera. I'm here to share a perspective that's focused on uh, trade uh, and specifically how it has been shaped after the Anglo-Dutch Treaty 1824. Uh, if you'll just give me a moment to share my slides. I hope that you can see these slides on your end. Let me know if you do. Hello? Yeah, I think I can see it. Okay. Um, okay, I I will begin by uh, following up on Dato Sabirin's um, lecture about the Anglo-Dutch Treaty 1825. I would not go too much into the history of it, just the parts where trade is concerned, but I wanted to reiterate something that he has touched upon. Um, these slides are just for visualization purposes, so you can have a look. Uh, this is Stamford Raffles. Um, I wanted to highlight how his vision in the region at the time was to conquer territory. Um, uh, sorry, not territory, but trade. Uh, this is a difference between the British and the Dutch at the time. The uh, Stamford Raffles have envisioned a commercial emporium. He wants there to be a fulcrum in which he can influence the area but he's not interested in taking territories in the way that Dutch, uh, that the Dutch is doing so. In a way, this also reflects how uh, the differences between Mary Liberum and Mary Closum uh, was argued by the philosophers. Uh, Stanford Raffles was interested in open, in a free port, which means that the trade can flow through uh, this fulcrum that he's envisioning. While the Dutch wanted to control the territories uh, in a way that the the straits around it is controlled solely by the Dutch and um, will not allow any other European nations uh, to come in. So that's the difference between the two. But um, here we'll have a look at Singapore. This is where Stanford Raffles envisioned that the fulcrum should be in. He sees that to be um, a central area where trade from China as well as from the peninsula and this region can flow through in a free and open port. So at this time, China's trade was already burgeoning, so he needed a base, a significant one that uh, rivals and stops uh, the Dutch influence in the area. So I would argue that a lot of this just boils down to trade monopoly and control of the seas. Basically, uh, from my perspective, this all alludes to the supply chain economics. You're looking at the Straits of Malacca. And of course, this has been uh, rightly so perceived by many uh, philosophy, philosophy, philosophers and also uh, conquerors in the place is that whoever is Lord of Malacca has this hand on the throne of Venice because the trade route is so significant. Um, whoever has control of the straits will have a hand in international trade. So uh, from Europe 
to Asia and as well as the uh, the Bengal states. So at this time, you can see below here, the, there is a lucrative spice trade in the Moluccas. And this, uh, this was uh, exploited. This was taken control of by the Portuguese. And then later on, uh, the Malacca was having control of the spice trade. But because this Straits of Malacca is such a vital maritime passage, because it connects the India, sorry, Indian Ocean, South China Sea, and Pacific Ocean. That's the, the nexus. It is the most direct sea route between the Middle East and as well as the burgeoning economies of China, East Asia. And that's therefore, it becomes a pivotal trade corridor. So here you can see, I am going to make the, the difference here between the British and the Dutch after the Anglo-Dutch Treaty. So before and after, you can see that there is British Malaya and then the Dutch East Indies. So under the British uh, influence would be the uh, Johor Sultanate, the Pahang Kingdom and Singapore. And then under Dutch influence is the Indagri Indragiri Sultanate and the Riau Linga Sultanate. Um, but I, I know that I mentioned the Straits of Malacca is a vital trade passage at the time, but there were other straits that were also of importance, especially to the Dutch. Uh, so if you see Straits of Malacca here, um, going towards China, and you can see that on the bottom, there's also the Sunda Strait, and then on the uh, even more bottom, the Lombok Strait. So these are uh, areas that are also uh, routes that are viable. It takes a bit longer and cost-wise, the Straits of Malacca is the most uh, cost-effective route. But these routes were used by the Dutch uh, in for control of the Spice Strait as well as their own uh, um, territorial uh, control at the time. But uh, it stands to, I would like to highlight that the, the area is a uh, passed through by roughly 80% of global trade and 70% of the volume is transported by this area. Passes through the uh, passes through the South China Sea as well, which is uh, one third of global shipping. Okay. So just to reiterate, if you pass through the Sunda and the Longboat Straits as well, there's also an additional one here in, Sing in Australia. This is the Malacca Straits, uh, the shortest and most economical route, and it is the Sunda Strait, and this is the Lombok Strait. At the time, the Dutch uh, found it much more prudent and beneficial for their businesses to stay in the Sunda Strait and the Lombok Strait areas because they found that their uh, control of the trades that they already have would be uh, the viable route for them would be the Sunda Strait and the Lombok Strait. Um, which is, okay, uh, in these, in these times, how do I say this, uh, these figures, okay, these figures were counted in these times, not, especially, uh, it's not uh, counted during uh, the, after the Anglo-Dutch Treaty, of course, I cannot uh, encapsulate or capture the economics during uh, that period, so just to illustrate, I have these figures for you just to illustrate the, the alternative routes. But um, right after the uh, treaty, you can see that there is a growth in intra-Asian trade. So I, I want to highlight here that it's a, a quite difficult to actually capture the economics of the region after the treaty, specifically because some records were not shown, uh, perhaps those by the British uh, East India Company and the Dutch companies were available. And this was uh, analyzed in a study by Kaoru Sugihara in 2009. But she focused on, of course, the, the companies themselves and uh, in a wider range of um, British trade and Dutch trade. So uh, just to illustrate, you can see here that at the time after the treaty, you can uh, have a look at how the East India Trade Company uh, had these intra-Asian trade connections, uh, which included um, their bases in Bombay, Bengal, Madras, in China, in Singapore, as well as Java, Madura. 
So this Java Madura is the Dutch uh, equivalent, uh, the Dutch aspect. And then there are the other Asian ports such as Penang and Ceylon. Um, this was actually due to lack of information uh, on the other Asian ports. They did also mention that in the records, they did not have uh, perfect records of the number of Chinese junks that came into the area at the time, which can be said to be a lot more that is recorded here in the study. Um, but what I wanted to, to show with this intra-Asian trade that grew after the, the treaty was that there is a difference between mercantilism to forced free trade in the South and the Southeast Asia. And this was argued by Kaoru Sugihara after the treaty itself, which focused on mercantilism, which means a lot of exports were cut, were going out. That was the way uh, that the, the companies thought that they could thrive. Um, the vision of having free trade by Stanford Raffles and this free port in Singapore uh, pushed intra-Asian trade and then later on, uh, a more international global shipping arena. So because of this, a lot of the, uh, the Western private traders and also the Asian merchants were, uh, were able to seize a lot of trade opportunities and commodities that came into the area. Um, and because there was an increased demand from the long distance trade and the availability of improved ships and ports. Uh, at this time, Singapore was already developing its infrastructure at the river itself, which is where most of the vessels were traversing. So the growth of the intra-Asian trade in this period was really a result of Asia's response to the Western expansion. So, um, okay, I, and, okay. And, okay, I, I will not go into the numbers here, but I wanted to show that at this time, Singapore was taking over the role of Penang. Uh, in Kaoru Sugiara's paper, she worked in analyzing the intra-Asian trade under the colonial rule. And one of the uh, one of the big the starting points of that analysis was how India was exporting its its products. And at that time in 1811, Madras was very much the center of intra-Asian trade with links to Bengal and uh, Southeast Asia and China, and of course, Britain. And long distance trade at this time was not as prominent. It was ancillary and the main contributor to the Madras trade was intra-Asian trade until uh, the 1840s. And up until the 1820s, Penang was the center for long distance regional trade for the Bay of Bengal. Um, but by 1828, Singapore pretty much took over this role and became uh, the center for long distance and regional trade, especially to China. Uh, it took a long time for Singapore to reach long distance trade, but even at this time when Singapore was taking over, Penang was still an important uh, base uh, when it comes to trade with Southeast Asia and Madras. So... At this time, uh, what I want to highlight here is that the trade within Southeast Asia and China at this time were much larger than Europe's share. And the intra-Asian trade was the highlight of this, this, this period. So here you can see Asia's share in world exports uh, in pound million. Uh, the figures shown here, I, I want to say again, as stated by the author, is meant to be representative of the time period and not meant to be completely accurate. But you can have a look at um, the Dutch East Indies numbers and the street settlement settlements numbers, their share in world exports. So India has the largest share, uh, even at 1840, which is well after the treaty. And uh, after a while, you can see that Singapore has become a transshipment center. So uh, I did mention that Singapore was envisioned as a free port. Uh, what Stamford Raffles did, first things first, was to develop the infrastructure along the river where the vessels were traversing. And this was a difference between the Dutch and the British in which Singapore, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Singapore developed the infrastructure without uh, interference from political powers. So 
trade became central to the operations. And a and as such, a lot of materials were provided for building the infrastructure without any political subjugation uh, as compared to the Dutch. So this became an autonomous space, um, not just for the British and for uh, the peninsula in Singapore, but also uh, for the Dutch, um, as well as any rulers, chiefs or Chinese Kongsis that were around the area. Uh, because it's such an autonomous area, even though there was the treaty that said that you cannot traverse in some areas and you cannot interfere, the free port uh, somehow made the area porous. Uh, so a lot of uh, influences, a lot of trade, a lot of uh, ideas also went through uh, Singapore's area itself. Um And as for the commodities that were traded at the time, you can see that there are routes that are carrying certain commodities, such as opium uh, for, uh, for British products. You can see there are a lot of straits pro uh, produce. So straits produce are mostly uh, produce you can find in the region of Nusantara itself. This is a lot of the forest products or marine products that came from um, the Nusantara, you can see here, the Celebacy and Batavia, the Straits produce came mainly from here. But uh, just to show you the exact commodities, opium made the largest share of commodities in trade. And then there's European cotton cloth, Asian cotton cloth. Um, as you can see, coffee, pepper, raw silk. Other ones in red are mainly produced and consumed in Asia. So just a snapshot. Uh, what do you of know, course, sorry, um, Rila, what year was that? Um, what, what period? Yeah, 1840. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so then in 1869, the opening of the Suez Canal, really significantly accelerated the passage of steamships from Europe to the Far East. And of course, the volume of seaborne trade and commerce transiting the Straits of Malacca and Singapore um, uh, increased. And the trade routes as we know it today has been established. Uh, and even when the Panama Canal was opened in 1914, it was still cheaper to convey goods from East Asia to the Atlantic uh, ports um, true, Singapore and the Indian Ocean and the Suez Canal. So this was the most co uh, cost-effective route uh, until today. And before I go into the choke points, I just wanted to show here how Singapore's uh, core business of transshipment uh, lasted until after colonial periods as well. So here you can see along the Straits of Malacca, transshipment ports uh, were in Penang, were in Malacca, Johor Bahru, and Singapore, as well as Medan. Some of them lasted after the colonial period, some of them did not. Uh, Malacca, of course, uh, changed directions after its uh, glory days uh, from the Sultanate of Malacca into what we know today as a heritage city and a historical port city, uh, which has burgeoning tourism um, uh, sectors. But um, one second, I I also wanted to highlight that um, at this time, I've highlighted a lot of Singapore's advantages after the treaty, which included infrastructure development by the British. But uh, Malacca also at the time had uh, a hinterland and hinterland for uh, maritime trade is very crucial because it transports the cargo from the seas through the ports and the go downs and the warehouses into the roads and the rail racks that goes to uh, retail. So the hinterland here is the infrastructure when it comes to trains and roads. Um, yes, and the warehouses. So at this time, Malacca did have its hinterland and it existed for its entry port and uh, they did have distant zones at least 200 miles from the port where the products, the commodities and trade were uh, were produced, extracted, and packaged. Okay, so today, you can see that these areas are, of course, it's pretty to say that the Straits of Malacca is, is vital, 
but there are quite a few global shipping choke points. Here you can see the Malacca Strait has a big share of the choke points traffic, which means the, the goods container ships go through the Malacca Straits uh, in a big share. Here's the biggest share. It's just second to the South China Sea, which is 37.1. And when it comes to oil, uh, the Straits of Malacca is just second to the Straits of uh, the Strait of Ormuz when it comes to the major choke points. I do want to say that um, Dato has already pointed out that the Straits has at, at more than eighty thousand vessels passing through it every day. Uh, sorry, every year, but. Uh, there is some capacity for it to have more ships, except for the fact that it will increase risks and also degrade the environment, which is why there are a lot of uh, discussions of alternative routes. So here you can see the uh, total number of ships passing through the Straits of Malacca from the 2000s uh, to 2022. And it has been increasing, um, which is why discussions of alternative routes before the Straits of Malacca becomes a uh, too congested has to be discussed at this point. So um, from, okay, caveat here is that 200 years is a very long time for me to have an analysis in terms of trade and economics. So I am unable to capture uh, year by year and go back 200 years, but I can show you a snapshot of uh, the period during and then today and perhaps the future. So, which is why we're, we zoomed in so fast to today. But today, as you can see, Singapore is the top uh, number two in the top 100 container ports uh, globally. Um, it has the capacity for, as you can see in 2022, uh, 37 million TEUs. And then there is Port Klang at number 12. We had 13.7 million TEUs and Port of Tanjung Pelepas at number 15, 10.5 million TEUs. So these ports are the prominent ports uh, along the Straits of Malacca today. Of course, taking advantage of the global choke points and the number of vessels now transiting through the Straits. And there are uh, the busiest ports in the world right now. So you can have a look at Malaysia's major container seaports uh, flow of container goods, um, mostly in transshipment, as you can see here, makes up the biggest percentages. Um, okay, and then as I've spoken about the hinterland in Malaysia, these are the numbers for the containers carried by rail and road from 2004 to 2013. I'm, I apologize for the outdated data, but just for a snapshot, you can see here that the rail is rather underused compared to the road, uh, the, the roads. So the percentages here are much bigger than the rails. So the existing Malaysian rail network connects the container seaports and the hinterlands, but not utilized at capacity at all. Uh, because the low share of the rail freight of containers is about like 2% to 2.7% maximum. So here, there's an imbalance of a modal split in land freight transport. So it, it has a little bit of challenges for seaports, hinterland connectivity. And connectivity is very important in maritime trade because uh, the more efficient your ports are, the more efficient your hinterland has to be to receive uh, such cargo and also bring it up to packaging and goods and making sure that they get to the industrial areas. Um, and then from the ports connect, uh, sorry, from the ports effectiveness, you will also see road congestions, and then these issues are going to exacerbate the port's performance in the long run. So the rail should, at this point, be used more. Okay, these are just uh, for you to see the comparisons, because when I say region in this presentation, I wanted to show um, the demarcation between the Dutch and the British influences. So I would say, in today's words, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. So uh, you can have a look at how Singapore is taking the lead with Malaysia 
uh, second and then Indonesian uh, performance in grey. So this is for world trade and merchandise trade, just for comparison. And then this is for water transport, which means your vessels. Uh, also the same case, except for... Yes, also the same case. Sorry, the grey has been switched up from Indonesia and Singapore. Okay, um, before I go into this. So for 200 years, um, the impact of the treaty itself, which really effectively demarcated the lines between the Dutch and British influence, um, gave the region the infrastructure development it needed to develop its ports, which means once its ports is um, upgraded, has the right facilities and services, it is able to uh, serve world trade and global shipping. Um, and I would argue that the hinterland, as well as the port infrastructures, are the key points here to be uh, to to be considered as big factors in how this um, in how the nations can flourish and develop from there. So in today's landscape, I think that after the the treaty, the infrastructure and the hinterland, as well as the straits advantages, are now transforming into. Uh, different things. I think that there are other avenues we need to consider as well, as, 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 such as the newer landscape for routes. Um, we, of course, when acknowledging that the, the Straits of Malacca is vital, we also acknowledge that at capacity, it will have adverse effects. So we cannot let it get to uh, capacity and then beyond. So before that happens, a lot of shipping companies and, and ports around the world are already looking for alternative routes. And there are many alternative routes, except for the fact that because they're not so uh, uh, traversed by the rest of the world, a lot of um, challenges also await. So here, China is trying to um, uh, overcome some of its um, cost ambitions by developing the China's Belt and Road Initiative, which would be very beneficial for the other investor st uh, states as well. Um, and it spans and it spans a long way, not just uh, through the seas, but also uh, through land transportation, which I've mentioned before, hinterland is completely crucial for maritime trade. And as for Malaysian developments, I wanted to highlight here that uh, although port planning is doing very well, we are neighboring Singapore's a very leading advancement in ports and global shipping. So uh, Port Klang is also developing Pulau Keri as uh, one of the third, uh, as the third port in Port Klang. So Port Klang now has West Ports, North Port, and Pulau Keri is being developed as we speak. So Keri Island would uh, would bring up the capacity to forty to to rival Tuas Megaports. Uh, capacity of 65 million. So to us, Megaport here, as you can see, Singapore's targeted completion is in 2014. Uh, sorry, 2040. And it will have 65 million TEU capacity. Uh, and it is already uh, developed in phase one. So phase one was um, offici officiated uh, recently, last, last year, I think. Yeah. And uh, so I mentioned uh, alternative routes. One of the most hotly debated routes is the Northern Sea Route. So here you can see the Suez Canal and the Straits of Malacca route, which is the usual route. It is 12 point, sorry, 12,894 miles. But have a look at the Northeast Passage here. If ships were to traverse this Northeast Passage, it takes only 8,452 miles. So it's shorter and would be more economical, except for the part where this is the Arctic region. And so this area is icy and has icebergs, and it does not get traversed unless uh, it's summertime and the ice has melted. That only... Uh, that that amount of time is only two to four months in a year. Um, and uh, unfortunately, with climate change coming, people are envisioning that these 
months will become longer and then they'll be able to traverse the northern sea route. So this is a possibility. And but if not for the climate change, immediately there's already developments between China and Russia in making icebreakers. So icebreakers are vessels that has the technology to break through the icebergs and the icy areas. Uh, and Russia has a lot of these icebreakers and China is also looking into getting some. So if they have the icebreakers, which is a significant investment, I, I would have to say uh, the shipping industry is a very capital heavy uh, industry. So to have these vessels will allow you to traverse this much shorter and more economical route. So this is one of the things that the shipping industry is looking towards now. And uh, speaking of cost effectiveness also around the region, in China is looking at the Kra Isthmus uh, possibility. So instead of going through the Suez Canal and then going through the Straits of Malacca, they were hoping to bypass and go through the Kra Isthmus here at the uh, uh, at these at this area. This this is the land area of Kra Isthmus. So at first they proposed to um, make a canal, but that has later been changed into a land bridge, which uh, will will require the building of a uh, hinterland and then two ports, two mega ports from each side of the uh, Kra Isthmus. So from the, from the entrance and to the exit. And that's a significant investment for the two ports to be built just to have a shorter route. And the route itself uh, is, uh, the economics of that route itself is does not look too promising, but uh, Thailand has just recently revived this 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 idea and looking for investors uh, since last year. So this might be in the pipeline sometime soon, as long as there are investors that are interested. So yeah, here you can see the the route that will be taken by the Kra Isthmus. The proposed canal is here with two ports on each side. Okay, so um. Indonesia in this equation perhaps has not uh, uh, taken the development of port route as much as Singapore and Malaysia. But recently, Indonesia has gone back to its roots and uh, revised its history as a maritime empire and considered um, that they should, they should now rise up as a naval maritime power again um with with a uh, with several aspects not just defense but also trade and also uh developments of infrastructure so indonesia with the presidency of uh joko widodo and Yusuf kala in 2014 envisioned that indonesia should achieve this ambition uh soon which is why you can see recently indonesia has moved its capital to the nusantara region here, the new capital will be paid will be placed here, as you, if you can see the screen here, in Kalimantan. It is named Nusantara, uh, and this is Sabah and Sarawak. So there'll be new avenues here, which we can see. Hinterland is going to play a very big role in connecting the two. Uh, a uh, very opportunistic uh, time in Nusantara's nation, um, Nusantara city building and the trade that will come from there it's, uh, as well because Sabah and Sarawak ports are also uh, going to be capitalizing on the movement of uh, human resource as well as commodities and trade, which is going to be more connected with the Sarawak Pan Borneo Highway project. And Okay, I'm almost at the end. I'm so sorry. Okay, I, in my personal opinion, I wanted to see the extent of the impact of this treaty, which ex which has now reached two hundred years, and um, we can see that the the trade so far has been shaped primarily by the advantages of the region and influenced by colonial history. Yes. But the, the impacts of the historical influence perhaps is seeing a turnover or I can say disruptions, emergence of very new factors that will then take over and shape the region in very, very new ways. So, oh, one second. So if, if you look at the shipping industry and the port industry today, you will see that a lot of emphasis has been 
placed on um, how the industry is going to be moving in the future. And that's going to look very different from the commodities and trade, as well as the global shipping and the port infrastructures today, because they are already moving towards, for example, digitalization of their papers and their um, uh, trade um, uh, trade bills, uh, as well as their ledgers, everything is moving towards digitalization. And that means that the efficiency and transparency, as well as the risks of cybersecurity is going to increase. And as I've mentioned, a lot of the vessels that traverse through the straits are still very much manned by seafarers. But in the future, you'll see pro perhaps automated vessels with no um, seafarers or just controlled by ports uh, or virtually or via cloud. And that's also going to be perhaps advantageous, perhaps risky, because if Northern Sea uh, is risky to traverse without icebreakers or with icebreakers, if the vessels are not manned, it could be safer. So there are a lot of avenues and advantages which is going to be very different from the landscape that we see today. There are going to be different disruptions, such as the pandemic, which really forced the ports to build better resilience in its infrastructure, as well as its systems, which is why we're going towards digitalization now. And sustainability in ports is also a very big uh, uh, avenue we're looking at. The International Maritime Organization has made several sustainability initiatives um, mandatory, such as the sulfur reduction in, in fuels of vessels. And uh, shipping industries are really struggling to catch up, ex especially the smaller players. Uh, but this is the landscape now. More and more of the ports and the shipping, in shipping companies that has the advantage to provide for sustainable solutions or infrastructures or, or machinery are going to be leading in this era. And uh, I also think that last mile delivery at this point is going to be something that has to be focused on. And I think China has uh, envisioned that this is going to be the best way to go forward if a lot of the maritime routes are going to be uh, difficult to traverse to. They also have the Belt and Road Initiative. And as, as I've said, the disruptions such as the pandemic and uh, the new advents of uh, automation and sustainability will also require supply chain resilience. It's a lot of the industry's concerns are based on the supply chain's resilience and how it can adapt to the newer advents that we perhaps cannot see coming and how we can affect uh, the supply chain and global shipping, such as the numerous wars and uncertainties in the geopolitical areas at seas right now. Um, so these are some trends that I think uh, will be shaping the region from here on. Of course, I, I also think that the, the treaty itself has uh, completely shaped the, the region in a beneficial way. I think that will have to be amalgamated with the newer trends that are coming up to really uh, show you a new landscape. And that's what I have for now. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Shuda, for your giving us a, a scenario of uh, the landscape or seascape uh, in terms of ports and uh, uh, how new technologies are affecting trade, culture, uh, flow of ideas, and, and also the configuration of nation states uh, in this region. Uh, as a result of uh, developments in other parts of the world. So I pass it to you. Yeah. Dato. Thank you, Dato. Uh, thank you, Uda, for, for the presentation. Uh, I, I think we're in the end now. I think probably uh, the most fitting uh, conclusion would be how to uh, look, you know, the experiences based on this treaty 100 years ago how do we come up with new one? Not to have the treaty, but you know the, the geopolitics is always active. You know, we have a issue of uh, security, uh, competing maritime um, powers in South China Sea now. We have the, the emergence of Indonesia now. Uh, we are there, when they are they're moving the capital, you know, from Jakarta to Nusantara, 
And you know, as a one scholar from Indonesia, they say why they choose this place because it is already planned by Sukarno in 1957. Uh, and, and it is so central to to ASEAN actually, you know. So, um, and it is a vast uh, land, you know, and resources. So, so uh, but when we made our study with my team to uh, port in Sabah and Sarawak, you see that probably we are we have the advantage because we have natural ports there. So we have a good highways uh, in uh, Kalimantan, you know, but you can go in the area of Sempurna or there near, near Labuan, you know, so the, the area of uh, uh, Buford, you know, and Sindumin. So I think they could complement, you know, they complement. And probably like Kuantan, Kuantan ports, you know, could become intraport, you know, for uh, for in, in Kalimantan or like, like uh, Pontiana. So uh, we see this, you know, but uh, before that, we have the two two comp competing powers, the Dutch and the British. But now we have uh, the ASEAN. We have excellent forces like China now, or the States. Okay. And France now has become very active now in the Indo Pacific things, you know, because people don't realize that France, they have they have the uh, EEZ for their islands in South Pacific okay. as big as Europe. So. That's why they are, they are a bit uh, in the AUKUS, uh, you know, controversy. They are a bit, you know, disappointed because actually they didn't see it. Because they didn't see it. France, the man, no, but France in in an ocean, France in in New Caledonia, Haiti, you know, in South Pacific. Now the EEZ that is so big that they have to take care. Because under AUKUS, yeah, but because you can draft like like us because you have like uh, amoeba. You know, this uh, you you have for for, for the for the for the uh, sovereignty uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, territorial sea, but beyond that, we have what we call it sovereign rights. You don't own it, but you, you can have that. You know, maybe you can exploit the oil and gas, the uh, the the fisheries. You know, kind of, and that's very important now. Important now. That's why it that now become a very important. So. Although you don't have sovereignty there, but you have sovereign rights. Nobody can take care, you know. Uh, nobody can uh, really take your uh, your uh, oil and gas, you know, uh, fisheries, you know, continental shelf, uh, all these things, you know. So uh, the UN come here, all see now it's very important in place now. So uh, we cannot see like before, you know, it's only dominate sea now. We have this under UN come here, all sea or UN. A commission 1982 that now you have other powers given it like now indonesia now it, it's it's like a state now because they have actually uh, they're already their their the quest for archipelagic nation have been uh, you know granted under your commission to see so they are actually now a tanah air really. it's a real, real yeah. tanah air now yeah so there is territoriality with that concept yeah yeah because it brings some powers in you know? because uh, the power at Territorial sea, which is total mile maximum, is as good as you are on land. Yeah, yeah. But beyond that, the territorial mile plus continent shelf, yeah, yeah. you have that right, which is sovereign due. It's not sovereignty, but sovereign rights. You need the rights to fish, yeah. the right to have a subsoil, hydrocarbon, uh, things like that, you know. So it's vast now, yeah. China, I think the way I look at it, you know, you see China, they're actually surrounded by so-called uh, opposing sides. You know? If you're being a China yourself, the only way to go out from China is through the area. You go up, then you have a, you have a Russia, you have a you have a Korea like knife, you know, the knife to you, and you have a uh, you have a Taiwan, you know, uh, Taiwan under the backup of this uh, nine freedom, and you have a you know. Uh, Vietnam, they have uh, 100 years, you know, in the most city. And the only way they out for them is this area. Mm -hmm. So that's why they, they, they actually, they, they just uh, ignore the rule of the law now. Like they, 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 the concept of artificial island is, is quite clear. You cannot build an island unless you have an island like Pulau Perak, Pajara. They have life in its own. Both people have a number mentioned that they can live you know, in the island, using their own natural resources like water or whatever, you don't have, you cannot, you know, pour cement and make this and then 
bring water from outside that is not what is recognized under the UN uh, convention. But the China, they just do it, you know, do it because it's so high at stake, you know. So this is uh, the bigger issue. So I think when we, when we look at this, and 1836, we have this, the challenges about they want to have a monopoly of, of, of trade. But now uh, we are, I think, intra-ASEAN. We have, what, 300 million people in ASEAN now, you know. Uh, how do we actually uh, improve ASEAN, ASEAN, uh, you know, uh, to become uh, an entity which can, you know, become like one entity, you know, to fend off challenges from outside, you know, uh, powers. So this is not easy to say, you know, but, but so I think, I don't think we can, it's prudent now to have another treaty because we already have got UN Constitutional Law of the Sea, yeah, close, yeah, since uh, 40, 40 years ago. So now it's in place. There are people some complain about some provision, but the nature of it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, host trading nature. Yeah, it become now accepted, you know. Uh, even the countries we don't agree with some of the provision now accepted it because of this issue of uh, the uh, national, sorry, the international uh, customary law. But the majority of the countries can agree with that, you know. They call it uh, opinion juris generalis, you know, which is one of the sources of uh, law of course, it's a written law, and then this opinion juris generalis, which is customary law. I mean, or oh, other people use it, so we, have, we follow, we take along, thing like that. So that's how they are using it now. So, so I think, uh, and, and have, unless you have other questions, we can discuss, you know, but I see that, and it's important for us now, for the 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 leaders of the non law from Malaysia, the nations here, to look what will happen in 120 years. That's actually when Indonesia moved their capital to Nusantara. I think they have a bigger uh, perspective. Do we have the same thing about Sils of Malacca now? What do we have? It, you know? mm -hmm. If true enough that they have this uh, uh, land bridge uh, over Krakenel, you know? uh, uh, we may study in Mima before that, you know, uh, it wouldn't affect us that much. Uh, not, not that much. Because of that, you know, we are, we, we are, we are producing countries. And then, like just like highways, you know, who determine actually uh, the bus stop where? You have uh, along the not, uh, plus highway, many uh, RNR, RNR. But people stop only at Seremban, yeah. at Pago, or at uh, Tapa. Okay, why? They might reason what? So, the power which determine where the ship goes is the ship management company. So, they say, oh, go to Singapore. Even now also, you know, there are ships from... Uh, from uh, Baltic state, oh, sorry, from this uh, Denmark, all this Norway area, you know, the, they, they send their ship for drug docking in Singapore. Why? That's my reason for it, right? So, this uh, treaty has given, uh, you know, a real opportunity for Singapore to grow until now. Or well, they had the history, you know, for someone to take, or oh, now you go to this uh, crowd, or you go to this uh, another route. It's not that easy. Because you know the pilot also I want to go to Singapore, I want to go to Klang, the yeah, bypass Klang, thing like that. You know? So this is a lot of uh, complexity challenges. But I think uh, looking at history, I think uh, the the strait uh, will be as important in the future. But you must take care now. Uh, the new uh, development, like you know, uh, now uh, IMO, the Italian Metal Organization. Which control of this, uh, uh, which uh, uh, this uh, international regulation, they are going to have like uh, twenty fifty green voyage. That means all must be green now, and then we have the issue, but the issue of emission, the issue of uh, uh, port automation that Huda mentioned. You know, in Singapore they're going to amalgamate all the ports now from Tuas Pasir Panjang into Tuas ports now. In twenty forty they have like sixty five million TEUs all fully automation. That means drivers, lorry driving from Malaysia are not needed anymore. Yeah. Now people, now, now like, like lorry drivers now, they all they got it cheap from Malaysia because they earn sing dollar. Yeah. But in 2040, they don't need because all automated. All automated they can use screen, whatever, you know, it's very, very uh, impressive. So, uh, so I think the, the country you want to flourish on this and keep uh, important, you know, uh, because uh, if we maintain that Straits of Malacca become a busy uh, waterways, passageways for trade. 
that is good for the country. Yeah. And you see now, so far, uh, the streets of Melaka now, uh, the ports uh, in Malaya, the old Malaya, is more uh, more uh, advanced or uh, busy than ports in the Indonesian side. Okay. You know, I know. It could be because of the the, the people in Indonesia probably they are more in the Dutch probably keep more on the culture, and they have the that 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 that's that culture, yeah. And we are more on trading, so they are building ports, Penang, uh, Port Well, and they have this clang, and then they have now, it's all on this side. So it's our in our interest that we should maintain this for future ones. So we hope we hope our, our leaders would have this this vision, what to do next, yeah. And and I think uh, probably in law now, which there is, because we are, we are too busy uh, using all resources, try to implement our our regulation by the uh, IMO, but we spend too much money on that. We don't have our own legislation, which is I think tailor made, bespoke, which is good to spoke growth in maritime trade in Malaysia itself. We follow international law created by the big countries for their interests. We spend money for implementation under Jabatan Laut Malaysia. Yeah. But we should have our own dedicated, uh, tailor-made, uh, bespoke one, which can attract like Caribbean. I'm oh, sorry, they're small, small island, British island, they have the move the banking system thing. So, so we should have leaders who should sit and think about this, how to make this country a real maritime nation. So far, with the claim, it's more because we are surrounded by seas, by geography, not really by the activities. Yeah, it's talking about, about it's like it's ship registering. Even then, lot countries like Mongolia or, or Laos, they have this uh, ship registry. We do. Yeah, we have, but too small. Because a lot of things that they want to register under Panama. Yeah, region, or, Panama register. Uh, register, register, whatever, yeah. So... <laughs> It take a lot of discussion on this, you know. But uh, Singapore, we talk when we raise the issue. Or I remember discussing this one one lecturer in in Cardiff about twenty five years ago. What you know, they rebut the issue of uh, Kra Canal. They mentioned Singapore, they own ports now. They own so many major ports outside Singapore. So even, yeah, yeah. so you see even at, at the airports now, you see yeah. some of the company, the name there, kind of, yang bridge to more from Singapore. So they've thought this long time ago. This uh, is Muskra is, a, is to me the Cold War relics. That I don't think is very, it's so expensive. Eh? And then, as you guys mentioned about, you know, you have uh, that, even the land canal, you know, you can you have that, uh, uh, Pipeline, but you have to build two ports and two charges. And do you think people are saying, I better go, I go to Singapore, I'm more easy. So, so, so you don't understand the ship, the company, which one determine we want you want to you want to visit which port you want to stop. Yeah, so yes. I thought, but with yeah, that, I we, think, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we, I, I end this unless you have a question. Thank you, Dato and uh, uh, any comments or questions from uh. Uh, those here and I uh, uh, check the uh, let me check on online if there's any. Uh, okay, not yet, <laughs> but I have some questions. I have many questions. Wait, uh, my late, <laughs> no, no, I I confine it <laughs> to a few. Only. I uh, I know that uh, the the the, the car Christmas car has been around, but I I, I think that uh, Singapore is has been ready over the last many decades. No, no problem that, but. Indonesia, I mean, Indonesia has declared itself as a maritime nation in, the, I think, 15 years back. I remember when at that time I was in Padang. I went to Padang. I, 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 uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, Padang, Pantu P, Bukit Tinggi. Then I saw this huge, uh, dekat Istana Hatta, Bukit Tinggi. Uh, they are discussing about uh, the future, a vision like Vision 2020 of Indonesia. And uh, one of which is uh, proclaiming a maritime nation. Uh, as such, uh, Indonesia has also declared itself as a civilization state uh, after China, following China. 
And China has never been part of the nation state system, uh, has been always uh, separate from the Westphalian uh, model. Uh, but coming back to Indonesia, Nusantara, I, I suspect uh, that uh, it, it's it's attempt, an attempt to re hegemonize uh, the archipelago, <laughs> the Tanah Air. Because uh, in, in the 70s, if you remember, we had Palapa, the satellite Palapa. And Palapa has uh, footprints all over uh, the archipelago. And Palapa is tempat bertapa, banjar pahit. Uh, the the seed and the essence of the psyche, the soul of of Indonesia, Jawa, Majapahit, no? that sanctum, inner sanctum, Palapa, uh, and and uh, so the satellite called Palapa is symbolic of that hegemony in the seventies. No? After that, only we had our own satellite, eh? and and now it's Nusantara. Why why the name Nusantara and and why is it there? Nusantara is again the literally meaning uh, the the uh, proclamation uh, uh, during the time of uh, of uh, uh it's it's uh, in in the in, in the in the document uh, negara kertagama uh, the the word of nusantara so i i suppose it's uh, rehashing or reviving that that civilization i'm looking at it from that perspective uh, yeah, th this is the thing. This is the thing. Uh, uh, and and uh, we seem to be marginalized in, in many ways. So it's it's what should we do? <laughs> you know, as as a nation state, as a nation state, uh, I don't want to see us uh, separate from from the larger uh, entity. Yeah? Uh, but but we seem to be there. Uh, and we we seem to also uh, uh, divide ourselves. For example, uh, you know, Rio Linga uh, has been neglected by our policymakers and by our scholars, just because it's at the border and just because it's in another country. Whereas Rio Linga is the, the center of uh, post Malacca modern Malay enlightenment, but it was broken by the Anglo Dutch Treaty. So again, what what should we do? Uh, policy wise or, or intellectual wise <laughs> or, or legal <laughs> um, what can we do <laughs> can. this uh, uh, because of this, this uh, development you know over centuries now and we come to have this now the acceptance that uh, many territories become nation states and we have a law now like the new and commercial law of the sea in which become the constitution of the of the of the uh, ocean. We I think not all ocean, but the whole because you know all 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 states have which have uh, 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 coast. You know, then they are they are they are they are bound by this. Uh, it's difficult now. I think the only way to to uh, to uh, 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 come back to the the old scenario is probably through culture. They mean, uh, in, uh, you know, like people 30 years ago, we talk about globalization. Yeah. So we all can have also this decentralization. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what way is that? You know, probably it's through culture more. But now we, like what happened now, uh, Indonesia, we're depending on Indonesian workers. Okay. Uh, but people don't think like in ASEAN, they should have a free movement even at the top level as well. Like professors, bankers, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah don't remember when I was small, we have uh, teachers, a uh, mathematics science teacher from Indonesia, yes, 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 yes. from uh, Etebe. You know? yes, yes. And we have this uh, very famous uh, business school at Manila, yeah? Manila. So now, right now it's, we are more concerned about this issue of this pekerja uh, bawah lah. If we have actually a, a free movement at that level as well, then you could, we can replicate what happened during the Malacca Kingdom, you know? The people come from... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think this is a good idea, you know, in terms of a free movement of of uh, thought leaders, of professionals. Uh, we had that, yeah, we had that. Uh, and, and also, 
uh, within well, ASEAN has two spheres. One is the Malay Muslim sphere, the other is the Buddhist. Yeah, they yeah. call it the Buddhist belt and the Islamic yeah. question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, we can capitalize. On, I, on I, I I saw on the tube uh, Wang Gangwu. Like, Wang Gangwu, yeah. Wang Gangwu uh, mentioned about this a very good uh, lecture on YouTube yes. during the last year about this thing. So I, I this is, I think, uh, the, the understanding, you know. Uh, that means the ASEAN is that we have. We have an ASEAN uh, meeting every yeah. year, you know, yeah. so Malaysia will be 2025. Yeah. We become the, the chairman. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, how, you know, like ASEAN Secretariat, you know? Yeah. So, so uh, actually, we can so resolve a lot of things within ASEAN. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah, because we have 600 million people and a lot of resources. Yeah. 600 million market. Yes. Also, look yes. at it. Yes. I remember Tun Mahadir when he was PM4. He wanted to uh, have this e e e e g remember yeah. another grouping, but it didn't, you know. Yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Another issue about this treaty, about this treaty, remember this. I think uh, I I would differ a bit from what uh, Professor Parashino mentioned about you know mm -hmm. that we have our own actually uh, kingdom which uh, which was interrupted by the Western powers. Yeah. Yes. But I think if without this treaty, mm. which eventually become uh, three spheres, you know, we have Indonesia, uh, Malaya, and then Malaysia, and then now Singapore, three. Mm. Without this treaty, I would, you know, uh, argue that, you know, there will be more territories. Because and remember, what is a, a, a writing mentioned about the first, the first uh, Malay Darba, mm. uh, 1896, mm. which become, you know, foreigner to the uh, first Malay state, FMS, yeah? Uh, when the fourth state for the first time came to Kuala Kangsa, uh, the son of Perak, Selangor, Negeri Sembilan, and Pahang, okay? Uh, before they were joined by non federated from Thailand and from Johor, okay? Uh, so, they say that it's the first time that the Malay rulers can sit together. <laughs> Otherwise, they they always quarrel about, uh, you know, about a lot of the petty, petty things, you know? Uh, so, if if let's say without this one, without the the power from outside, you know, uh, imagine without this, then we have let's say at least in here nine states, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nine states. You know? So, uh, well, this is uh, my, my my from what happened now, uh, what happened now, and we know our uh, attitude towards this thing are very you know, very uh, we call it clannish, you know, and we like to maintain our territory full although it's small, yeah. So the idea of big union like India or like America or like what now, you know? Yeah. But Indonesia as well. Huh? So it's a big one. So Sukarno came with the idea of the big one. Yeah. Mesti besar. Yeah, kan, yeah. Huh? yeah, yeah. Prof. Sukarno uh, forgot to uh, announce uh, independence from Malaya in 1945. <laughs> when he, he promised Ibrahim Yaakob in 1938. Of, uh, sorry, uh, before earlier, earlier than that. But... By the way, these are the events in history that uh, you know, it's uh, destined to be. But it's important to, uh, as you said, uh, I know recently we had this Panko declaration. Well, not to celebrate, but they say that to take the lessons from uh, 1874. So perhaps, uh, as you correctly mentioned, uh, lessons from 1824 that uh, we can deliberate later. Uh, very, very important. Uh, yeah, maybe is that can also uh, on seventeen March, you know what they say? Seventeen March, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I, I first uh, was exposed to UNCLOS in nineteen eighty four. I was, I was doing a course on international law in Minnesota. So <laughs> that, that's how, uh, uh, that, that, that part uh, on the ratification and uh, the facade of, of what it is. But what's important here also uh, in that sense is to uh, intellectually uh, deconstruct uh, some of these colonial treaties uh, not to overdo it. Of course, I was criticized for overdoing certain things uh, with regard to colonialism in Malaysia. How how far can we decolonize? Huh? Uh, you can read my book. Uh, I think it's not here. Uh, 
decolonizing the Penang story, uh, where I questioned the uh, treaty. But again, this uh, 1834 involves uh, uh, two nations or more. 1909 also involves uh, two nations, uh, uh, where uh, the Penang Treaty is so-called, uh, well, uh, my contention, no, no 1786 treaty, only 1791 and 1802 and, and, and uh, subsequent. So it, it, it's, it's uh, uh, I, I'm actually searching for PhD students or masters to uh, study these treaties from a legal perspective. I've made my announcement. Many have approached me, but they have not registered. <laughs> so, yeah. And this is a point that we have to take uh, to account. Uh, were there any questions or comments? Uh, if there are no questions or comments, we would like to thank. Uh, any words? Any uh, last words for today? <laughs> First, I want to thank uh, Huda from from Cambridge uh, for participating. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, and then uh, she's doing very important. Uh, very important uh, topic, I think she, she's going to propose, I don't know, it's a uh, uh, supervisor on the ports, yeah, ports in Malaysia. Yeah, we hope that she's she, uh, she one of the bright, brightest uh, in MIMA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we send to a good university, yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully he will become the subject matter expert in the yeah. near future. Yeah. And this area, not many people doing, you know, like uh, when you do port study, involve law, involve, uh, you know, uh, amalgamation of two laws, the, the municipal law, uh, and the law of the sea. Uh, because now a lot of ports, I forgot to mention that, you know, during the 1836, the ports were only like the, the old ports with the jetty. But now you have, you know, land reclamation, yeah. even one is the STS, ship to ship transfer. Another port at sea, you know, you just transfer oil. You know, when the two ships come together, they transfer cargo, right? They call it yeah. STS, yeah. which is... Ah, they do orang, they rapat, and then they they pinda cargo and very lucrative, you know, including on oil and gas. And so it's like now important for that. Yeah, and a lot of uh, money, you know, uh, in that. So so things change now. You know what happened now with the drone thing, whatever yes. issue of environment, yes. lot of things. So, but I think I I should thank Uda for you know uh, having the the courage to do, to have this research. And hopefully she wants she will do some case case study here. Yeah. So we want to use that research for for the country, you know. Uh, uh, not, what about the bridge from Malacca? Bridge from Malacca to Dubai? <laughs> <laughs> I, I already uh, informed through the party to the to my chief minister. Say, can I, you know uh, why it cannot be done? Done because of this left all over the sea. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the 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 transit passage, uh, doctrine regime in Central Malacca, or straight use for channel navigation, like one of them, you know, you cannot uh, uh prevent free flow. Okay, okay. Free flow, even when you build, you know, unless you want to do it downstairs, much like oh. Dover, punya, uh, punya, bawah. Tapi atas, even to be pantai, you know, what is the uh, quid pro quo or the agreement which uh, uh, which was uh. Uh, we didn't get good treatment during the unclosed negotiation. Is that you know, uh, we don't have that uh, twelve nautical uh, mile sovereignty as far as navigation is concerned. Before that, in the territory we have to call it innocent passage. But now we have a transit passage, even one feet from the okay, coast. Okay, okay, okay. That means you cannot uh, our, let our twelve mile impinge on a transit passage. Uh, that means uh, transit passage. Take in. Okay, okay. There's no more twelve nautical yeah, mile yeah. as far as yes, yes, yes. navigation is concerned. Uh, as far as uh, whatever it is still, but navigation. I mean, you do you want to uh, construct a bridge at the beginning? Then you already you know stop the the free flow of the navigation. 
Dia yeah, tertain tak perasan. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Dia no, no much. You know? Okay. So right. this is one thing that uh, the, 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 the this a new concept. They call it transit passage, used for the straight use for uh, navigation. So Melaka, one of them. I see. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Cik Uda and uh, so Dr. Dr. Sabirin for for the second last lecture of the Malay Maritime Project. Uh, we hope to come up with a small book uh, on the lectures uh, comprising uh, 17 chapters. Uh, at least a contribution from Mistech and a contribution to the space uh, with regard to Malay Maritime uh, Civilization. Uh, uh, we thank uh, those who are present. We also thank uh, Puan, Puan Zeni, our new Director of Administration, for his tech. Oh, okay, Puan Maizun. <laughs> okay, Puan Maizun is the... Uh, anybody wants to be uh, interested in art and culture, uh, she has a gallery. And thank you from Mima and uh, from... Uh, uh, news portal of Akabar TV. Yeah, I think you're covering it. Uh, so, uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you so much, everyone.